I want to take a moment to illustrate why we have to talk about hypothesis testing, the null hypothesis, error types, and confidence intervals. As it happens, there are some things going on in these tests that are often either misunderstood or unknown among quant students. I think it helps to know why you're going through these steps. So you've met, or will met when you do the readings, the null hypothesis. The hypothesis is my expected finding. The null hypothesis is the falsification of that hypothesis. Recently, my three-year-old granddaughter was upset to hear that the household was out of bananas. She folded her arms defiantly and uttered a perfect null hypothesis. No, we're not out of bananas. The null hypothesis is the claim that the hypothesis is false. It refutes the truth. Of the hypothesis. In our example of the hypothesis, all swans are white, the null hypothesis is not that all swans are black. That would merely be a different claim. Instead, the null will refute the truth of the hypothesis, not all swans are white. When we do hypothesis testing, we actually test the null hypothesis. If we reject the null hypothesis, we are justified in accepting the hypothesis. If, however, we fail to reject the null hypothesis, we cannot accept the hypothesis. But that is very different than proving something. That word prove gets thrown around way too often and should be a word that causes doc students to shudder in their sleep. Let me see if I can show you why. Karl Popper made the assertion that seeing or measuring something is only scientific if it is falsifiable. If we're going to know something empirically, that knowledge must also be measurably falsifiable. Not every statement is falsifiable. For example, I consider myself a kind of Wes Anderson evangelist and try to convince my friends and loved ones to watch every one of his movies. I enjoy them, and from my point of view, he is a great filmmaker. It is true that I love his films. That claim is not quantitatively falsifiable. Or imagine that I tell my wife that I love her. Try as you might, there is no love-o-meter that can measurably and quantitatively falsify that claim. So things can be true that are not empirically measurable. But just because we can measure something, or because we reject the null hypothesis, doesn't mean that we've proven a hypothesis. Consider our hypothesis that all swans are white. I will actually test the null hypothesis and attempt to determine whether I can support the null. I will look for a black swan. So I collect 100,000 swans and carefully analyze their color. In my sample of 100,000 swans, all of them are white. I couldn't find any black swans. And if my sample of 100,000 swans are all white, I have failed to support the null hypothesis, but that does not mean that I have proven that all swans are white. I have merely been unable to reject the null hypothesis, which in turn supported my hypothesis. It is still theoretically possible that there is a black swan out there somewhere like an entire breed in Australia that just didn't make its way into my sample. Just because I have failed to support the null hypothesis does not mean that I have proven the hypothesis. I have only supported it. So when we do hypothesis testing, we're actually doing some important things. First, the hypothesis test helps us establish falsifiability, ensuring that we're satisfying that criterion of epistemology. And second, the hypothesis test aids in our efforts to be objective by testing the null rather than the hypothesis. This is a very valuable way to try to avoid confirmation bias in a measurement. Third, the hypothesis test helps us find wording that avoids making claims that we can't support. 
I never say I have proven that all swans are white. Instead, I am able to say I have not been able to prove that not all swans are white, and therefore my hypothesis that all swans are white has been supported in this study. If I incorrectly reject the null hypothesis, and in so doing claim that the hypothesis was supported, that is what we call a type 1 error. In the case of the swans, I didn't have a large enough sample, or a sample that included swans from Australia, and as a result, I rejected the null hypothesis, and supported the hypothesis that all swans are white, even though they aren't. If, however, I incorrectly fail to reject the null hypothesis, and in so doing, claim that the hypothesis was not supported, that is called a type 2 error. In the case of the swans, imagine that my sample of 100,000 swans had a gray goose. Since I'm not a very good ornithologist, I assumed that the gray goose was a darkly colored swan. So I accepted the null hypothesis that not all swans are white, but that was just because I couldn't tell the difference between a goose and a swan. If I were a better ornithologist, my hypothesis would have been supported. Errors of type aren't actually about counting errors. They're actually problems of probability. We actually rarely have a hypothesis that asserts something like all swans are white. Usually our hypotheses are comparative, that one measurement will be higher or lower than another. In these scenarios, we're actually wanting to compare the probabilities that these measurements will be different. But the swans do help us see why we are very careful about throwing the word prove around. It is a word used by lesser minds. We, however, will be precise. We will reject the null hypothesis unless we fail to reject the null hypothesis.